uh, check that. But in the meantime, I think we should move on. So next up is Eric. Uh, so uh, apologies if I pronounce it wrong, but it's Eric <laughs> Shashkamota uh, from APC Paris. And uh, Eric, over to you. Uh, please feel free to start whenever you're ready. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Apatim. So I will try to share my screen first. Can you see my screen now? We, yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much. So, yes, you pronounce it right, uh, Pratim. I'm Eric Chasson Motin. I'm a senior researcher at uh, CNRS. I'm working in this uh, laboratory called Astroparticule et Cosmology, APC, um, which is on the campus of Université Paris Cité, Paris, France. I'm uh, working on, I'm, I'm part of the Virgo collaboration doing data analysis. And I'm also part of the GWASC team that uh, is the center that uh, is releasing the gravitation wave public data. So this is the subject of that, uh, of that uh, lecture now. So I'll build on what uh, Victoria uh, introduces uh, you just now and uh, uh, elaborate a bit more on the context. So um, what we'll be talking here uh, is the data um, from, uh, from those uh, five detectors. So you see uh, the LIGO detectors uh, in Anford and, and Livingstone, the Virgo detector in Italy uh, close to Pisa, the GEO detector in Germany close to Hanover, and the Kagra detector in the Kamiokande mine in, in Japan. Um, those detectors have been taking data since uh, five years. So the LIGO detector started uh, eight years ago um, in 2015. And you see the three major uh, phases uh, related to uh, data collection here, which we call uh, observation run, observational runs. Um, so you see three phases, O1, O2, and O3, with their duration, you see from few months to, to a year. And the uh, uh, various detectors, uh, Virgo, Geo, and Kagra, have joined the global network gradually uh, over this period. So during this uh, period, uh, well, we've seen in 2015, the first detection of gravitational wave with the, in this... Uh, uh, data and um, um, the events collected by the uh, detector so far, LIGO and, and Virgo only, have been uh, um, gradually uh, collected. So you see uh, the various uh, event count depending on the on the on the. I see I see somebody is trying to uh, drawing on my slides. That's okay. Uh, but all right, uh, just want to make sure that uh, everything is fine there. Um, so you see the various events uh, collected and, and really um, um, the rate of collection of event increasing with time um, um, as the sensitivity improves. And you see really uh, uh, a, a real change in the slope uh, of the event collection after O2. And uh, the, we expect that this will increase even more with the future runs as the sensitivity improves uh, further on. Overall, we have collected about uh, 90 events. And um, these are composed the so-called gravitational wave transient catalog that I'll be discussing further later. So the LIGO-Virgo-Cagra collaboration is committed to the principle of open science. This means that uh, we have a policy for releasing our data and this policy is, de is described in the data management plan. Uh, this is linked to this, uh, to this slide here. You'll have the possibility to take a look at this document. It describes the way uh, we release the, the, the data and the rule we follow to do this release. 
and the gravitational wave open science center so wask uh, which is available at this uh, url wask.org is really the instrument to implement this policy so on the wask uh, uh, web page so you see here on the on the uh, left here you'll see releases of gravitational wave data We'll see, you'll see event catalogs, so GWTC, and you'll see the required documentation and the software tools that you may need to use this data and to understand uh, the nature of the data. So, right, so this presentation here is really about uh, uh, the GWASC, uh, and uh, what I'd like to do now is, is a tour of the GWASC and um, so, as you see, we'll start with, with what, I mean, the primary function of the GWASC, which is uh, the availability of uh, the uh, data from LIGO, Virgo, CAGRA, and, and GEO. So you see here on the main page, you have two ways of accessing the, the data. So this is uh, um, there on the top menu, um, you, you, you see the get data download, or you can click on this direct button, explore data. And if you do so, you, you are led to this page, which is actually much longer than it seems here. Uh, the list of blocks here uh, extend uh, much to the bottom of the page. And um, it uh, basically what you can get here is access to the observation of um, the various uh, detectors uh, associated to the various runs on top of other uh, data release, which I won't have time to really describe here. So let's take, uh, all right. So when, when I talk about data, I, I first need to say what data I'm, I'm talking about. So as Victoria said, the detector, the interferometric detector here, are measuring the so-called gravitational wave strength, H, that uh, Victoria already introduced. So this is the differential length of my two rulers that uh, Victoria uh, spoke about. And, and this is a relative measurement. So this is delta L over L. Uh, this is something that measures the space-time deformation in a sense, and uh, caused by gravitational wave passing through the detectors. And uh, a bit more concretely and pragmatically, what this means is that this measurement is done during a, an observation run at any time, okay? And therefore, we are led to a time series, um, which uh, in fact is sampled at uh, 16 kilohertz. So this is very similar to what you get uh, when, you know, uh, music recording, you have a time series sample at uh, this uh, typical uh, frequency. Uh, well, on CD, it's 44 kilohertz, but uh, you, you see there is only a factor of four. And therefore, you could, in principle, uh, put this signal on, 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 a, on, on a loudspeaker and hear what the... the, the Various detector are recording um, in time. So this is really an audio type signal. Of course, this is long observation, typically for several months or to a, to a year. But uh, there are a lot of uh, on and off, on and off interruption that, uh, when analyzing the signal, you'll have to cope with, right? So this is not a continuous, uh, really continuous, strictly speaking, observation. You, there are a, a lot of breaks in there. Okay, so so far the available data sets are um, um, given in this uh, in this list here, and by uh, downloading them, what you have is all you need to reproduce the LIGO Virgo CAGRA analysis. So if you want to implement your own search, you have a great idea. You that that you or you silly want simply want to reproduce what uh, the LIGO Virgo and and Kagra have been releasing. Uh, you can do by downloading this data. So this is what we call the bulk the bulk data. So the entire recording for from a run. It is available in various formats, and you have to use data quality if you want to search for. Um, um, 
uh, event and signal. So the, this uh, information is also available along with uh, documentation. So far, three data sets, three major data set has been released. O1 was released in uh, 2018, O2 in uh, 2019 and O3 in two parts, A and B, in April and October of 2021. So let's uh, let's um, take an example here. So if I click on this uh, four kilohertz data button of O3A, oops, I'm going to this page here, which will allow me to access the O3A four kilohertz data from um, uh, Access access it uh, file by file. Actually, I, I think it's O3B. I, I circled the wrong button here. I should have circled the O3B button. This is the page I'm looking at. So you see here on the left, uh, you select the detector. So here I selected the Virgo. You start. You select a, a start time, an end time, the type of output format you'd like, and then continue. And then you're led to this list of files <clears throat> where, oh, I should uh, explain that uh, we in uh, gravitational wave analysis uh, measure time with the GPS clock, which is this long number, uh, something like a phone number, right? Uh, 12, 15, 56, 65, and so on. Uh, so these are times since uh, I don't remember which date in 1980. Uh, we don't, well, we can use UTC, but this is the primary time clock that we are using. So you, there, there are tools on the GWASC uh, website to allow you to transfer this uh, type of time to uh, any other time clock like UTC or whatever. Um, right, so I'm coming back to my list. I see here a, a list of files. Um, the, the files uh, the, the files correspond to four ninety six period four forty ninety six second periods of time. Um, sample either at sixteen kilohertz or done sample at uh, four kilohertz, and um, you see here this. Uh, well, the, the, the time period I requested divided into those blocks. And um, I can access that in HDF file, which is a portable format, file format, or into the proprietary uh, specific format that we have, that we use internally in LIGO Virgo Kagra, which is, which is the frame, uh, so-called frame format. Um, for each of those files, you see the last column here is the percentage of data in this 40, uh, 96 period long. So um, you see, because the detector are not working on, on all the time and maybe off part of the time in this segment, you don't have always 100%. Moving on. Um, so this was the file by file access. But uh, if you need to access a full run, like uh, you need to, to, to download many, many files, then this uh, uh, way of doing is, is not appropriate. And uh, we suggest that uh, you use uh, another way of accessing, of accessing the, the, um, the, the data, which is um, available here, a large data set. There is a specific block. And you can access those using the so-called CERN VM file system, CVMFS. And uh, I won't have time to uh, you know, provide a technical description of this. There is a documentation that explains how to do this. It's fairly simple. Um, this essentially allows you to mount a distance disk partition with the data. So the LIGO CAGRA partition um, that can be mounted on your local computer so that uh, you know everything would work as if you have the the the, the data access uh, like a, a member of the of the of the um, uh, collaboration uh, if you are in the us and uh, you work in in the us you can uh, conveniently use that to uh, um, access the data through the open science grid this is a 
I think, a distributed computing system that uh, is there in the US. And there is a third way of accessing the data through the API, but I'll discuss that uh, uh, later in my talk. So let's go back to the tour of the GWASC. So now I'm, you know, I've been describing the scientific data, so H of T, um, but we search this data, we found event, and we characterize those events, all these science and science products are available in so-called event catalog. So this is what you get when you click on this event catalog item here. So you're led to this page here, which is a long list of events. So each of those are signals that have been detected in the data and that correspond to a source, usually and primarily, well, those are mergers of compact stars, primarily black holes, black holes binaries, uh, but not uh, only. So uh, we have a list here, you'll have detailed presentation about this, I won't go into detail, but each of these is a, a binary merger where you see a version, I'll come to that next, the type, the catalog in which it has been released, the GPS time at which this event has occurred, and various numbers that correspond to characteristic of the binaries. So parameter estimated from the data. So let me go ahead. Um, so this is, well, what we just saw is really the, the catalog that is uh, called the GWTC, Gravitational Wave Transient Catalog. But we release, so this is a cumulative catalog that encompasses all catalogs we've been releasing. Um, the catalog we've released, so subset of these catalogs are notable events that are, you know, remarkable events detected and that deserve a, a specific publication. Okay, so this is the discovery releases. So this is one type of catalog we have. And then at the end of the run, when we collected the observation from, from the full run, essentially the big list of events, we uh, assembled those in a big catalog. So we have released so far uh, four catalogs, GWTC 1, 2, 2.1, and 3, with various flavors that you'll be um, presented uh, later. Um, the catalogs here, the full, each of those catalogs and the cumulative one can be queried through the online catalog query page. Uh, here is the path to access this query. Um, you see here that you can specify a range of various properties of the source, the range in time, um, and uh, the type of catalog. And you are, well, you do, you click on submit query and you return a list of events that you can get in various formats. So this is very convenient. And I think this will be even more convenient when the catalog will be much more, maybe few hundreds or maybe thousands of events. We hope that we'll get in the end with LIGO, Virgo, CAGRA. So when you start from this list, from this GWTC list, you have this list of events. And let me click on this catalog of this specific event here. So you understand the uh, meaning of this number. So this is, this is the date. Okay. So this is 20. Uh, so this is the 29th of January of 2020. At, and this is the UTC time in hours, minute, and second. So this is how we uh, called and we labeled our event here. Um, so let me uh, see what, uh, let me show you what you get when you click on this uh, event specifically. First of all, I want to uh, stress that uh, here I have one version of this event but I can have multiple version. And during the tutorial of the workshop, I think you'll have to take care of the fact that you may have various version of the, of the event. So you're led to a, an event page, which basically provide you with the description of the data provenance, uh, the type of data uh, that has been uh, uh, used to detect this event. Um, then there will be uh, another block that is related to the data snippet. So we provide 
uh, you with the a short segment of data centered around the event. So uh, two types, 32 seconds. So minus or plus 16 or basically an hour, 40, 86 seconds. Uh, so 248 uh, before and after in various formats. So frame format, HDF and text format. ASCII types of, of format. And then at the bottom of the page, there are a description of the way this event has been detected by search pipelines. So you'd have a specific lecture on this and um, parameter estimation. So what are the source parameter? Um, and here again, you will have a specific lecture on this part. Um, you have two images here that uh, make a representation of the data, a time frequency representation of the data. This is done through the so-called Q transform. So let me uh, explain what the Q transform here is. So it is often convenient. So what we are doing here is analyzing time series. Okay, this is H of T, and it's a it, can be convenient to have another representation of the exact same data, which is in time and frequency. A usual way of doing this is uh, by doing the so-called spectrogram or the short time Fourier transform. So you divide this, you divide this time series into blocks, and in each blocks you take the Fourier transform and you collect and you form a kind of a matrix, a time frequency matrix that is being represented here, and in which you you can have some other view and another. So you see here, for instance, you have a clear representation in which this signal here, there is some, uh, this is not an astrophysical signal. This is an instrumental noise, but you see here that this instrumental noise has various harmonics. So you can have a, an understanding of the, of the nature of the noise by looking uh, to this. The Q transform is some kind of a similar representation, but the way it tiles the time frequency plane is different. Um, and the way it does that is represented here on the right. It allows to have uh, a resolution that adapts to the signal in a sense, right? And that uh, is uh, some something that uh, goes um, uh, well with the log scale in which you can have a representation of a very broad band signals. So you can have a, a full description of the Q transform by looking to this uh, um, to this uh, reference here. Uh, but, uh, and if you have a, a question about this, I'm happy to uh, provide uh, more details. So let's, uh, uh, um, let's continue our tour. And again, with the third and last uh, data we provide that are so-called the timelines. So imagine that you want to start some analysis. Uh, you are interested into some period, uh, say during some part of the O1 data set. Um, so um, in 2015, and, uh, but you, you don't know whether the detector was, oper which detector was operating at that time. Um, how much of the time they were on. So this allows you to do, to answer that question. So you, you um, insert the data set, uh, start and a stop, and uh, you select the type of data quality. So this is important. Um, the way you do this is by this flag, uh, the detector. So for instance, H1, the search type. So you have more detail about this. This is uh, for instance, burst or CBC. And the severity of the data of the data quality, so the uh, um, the, the so-called category, you'll have a description of that later on. Cat one, cat two, or, or cat three, and then you are led to a file that uh, provides you with these uh, time streams of data quality signal, and also this type of plot in which you can understand whether the detector was operating yes or no, and with which data quality level. To conclude the tour of the GWASC, uh, let me uh, go to this uh, software item. So as I said earlier, we have an API, a web API that allows the access to, uh, to the uh, various data I've been uh, shown, uh, I've shown uh, so far. 
So the description of this API is described in this page here. You have the address, you can have the full description. This is a small part of this page. And um, this uh, API is implemented really as a Python client, which is called GWASC. And uh, during tutorial 1.1, which is the first tutorial that you'll have to do today, um, which is entitled Discovering Open Data from uh, Gravitational Wave Observatory, uh, you'll have to learn how to use this GWASC package. You'll see it's very simple and, and, and straightforward. This is essential uh, for the remaining of the uh, workshop, which where you'll see the difficulty increases. There are many other software utilities that are available on the GWASC uh, website uh, that allows you to simulate gravitational wave uh, signal, that allows you to analyze the data. You can uh, have a look uh, uh, by clicking on this uh, link that I have here. But uh, I'd like to move to the conclusion now. So I presume uh, that uh, if you are attending this school, this workshop, that you're interested in gravitational wave science, uh, you're maybe looking for gravitational wave data, then GWASC is your friend. Uh, we have 15 terabytes of scientific data that is available freely and accessible through the license, the Creative Commons license CC BY. And um, there is a lot of documentation and resources available on the GWASC. One thing that I haven't mentioned is the so-called data papers. So those are publications that sort of collect all the information I've given so far and even more um, into a, a, a paper that you can read. Um, so the last one we have is the one that we have on the, on the right here, on the left here. So this is the data paper that is uh, uh, related to the O3 data that you can access from the archive. If you want to ask questions, if you have questions and send feedback, I think you know already that uh, this WASC activity is linked to this user forum where you can ask questions to the community of users, where you can ac have access to experts that can address your question. So this is ask.eguin.org. And um, remember that uh, if you use the data, and we hope you do, and you and you make more science with the data. Please remember to acknowledge the use uh, following the, the instruction that is given on this page. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks, thanks, Eric. Uh, yeah, thanks, Eric, for the wonderful talk. Uh, if there are questions, uh, you can just write to me. Um, I actually can start with one question. <laughs> so uh, the thing is, you mentioned this different set of sets of events, like um, the the confident, the marginalized, and the auxiliary. Can you explain what what is really the auxiliary events? So I'm I'm not sure I I get where where are you. Uh, so when you when you look for say GWTC one or GWTC, I think right. two point one, okay. you say confident, marginal. Oh yes. Okay, sure. Yeah. Yes. So let me let me go here. Um, wait a second. Right, this one. Right. So when we release uh, uh, catalogs, um, uh, we separate the the event and the signal we detect, depending on the significance, the statistical significance that are attached to each of the signals. So we have, you know, a uh, sort of a convention uh, based on the so-called false alarm rate, which measure the some kind of a probability of that event to be uh, to be associated to the noise. And uh, <coughs> Based on the value of that number, we can either formulate it uh, that this event is a, a, an astrophysical event um, um, uh, confidently, or you know um, the significance may be marginal, and therefore we are uh, you know uh, 
a catalog that is a list of all confident detection we are making and uh, another catalog which collect all the marginal detection that uh, we made. And therefore, these are appear in the list as GWTC3 confidence or GWT3 marginal. So that's uh, that's it. And you need to make sure that uh, to understand really what is the convention, so it can relate to the false alarm rate, uh, as I said earlier, but it could also relate to the so-called P astro um, um, value, which is a, a Bayesian uh, a Bayesian um, num a Bayesian feature, a Bayesian figure of merit that uh, also um, um, includes knowledge from the past detection and a model of the uh, of the signal population of the source population. Uh, thanks, Eric. So sorry, I was uh, maybe I was not clear. So I, I'm aware of the confidence of the marginal. I was just more asking about the auxiliary one. So if oh, the auxiliary one. Oh, yeah. right. Okay. So this one, I'm sorry. So auxiliary means, um, means that, um, right. So this is, this is, a, um, there are detection during uh, this range here that was O2, that was uh, um, I, signals that were identified as uh, confident detection um, during uh, the O2 run. And that um, turns out after reanalysis to be um, uh, not to match the um, convention for making a confident detection, and um, and therefore uh, we list those as auxiliary because they were mentioned as even earlier in the first trial we did for the analysis, but they are not even anymore in the second trial. But since we've mentioned them already, they are they are really uh, part of the catalog as auxiliary. Got it. Thanks. So sorry, I took up most of the time. So uh, there are a couple of questions, maybe. Uh, so what is the difference between O3A, O3B, and O3GK data release? And uh, can you please go over the reason behind studying the Fourier or Q transform of the data? Maybe Q transform is the interesting question. So yeah. Okay. So. What 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 is what is the um, what is the uh, question what, really about the Q transform? Uh, it basically, to go over the reason behind studying the Fourier or the Q transforms. All right. The, yeah. Well, the, the the reason the reason about using the Q transform is uh, I think it should you know make sense already with this plot, right? If you stare at the time series that I that I show here in this in this uh, in in this example. You have a hard time understanding what what is it about? Is this astrophysical? Is this something else? Is this you know? And therefore, you'd like to have some collection of uh, of you, you'd like to have some more information about what is the really the the structure of the signal, and um, <clears throat> and and if you do so, then then indeed what what you get is really more information. For instance, here. You're looking at the Q transform on the right, you'll see that uh, this event that lasts for a couple of seconds have, you know, a number of harmonics that may be, you know, um, um, interesting um, frequencies to which you can possibly go back to some model of the detector and try to understand what is the nature of that uh, uh, transient that we are looking. And similarly, when you are looking at a, an astrophysical signal, so let me go back to this page here. Um, well, you know, in this example, you, you'll see really the, the chirping type of uh, structure that you expect from, from a merger, this power law evolution of the frequency in time, and, and possibly you could see also harmonics, right? Those are very um, interesting uh, uh, possibilities. There are uh, tentative of uh, uh, analysis of these higher order modes that uh, um, are predicted by general relativity as well. And, um, 
uh, that are important uh, tests of uh, general relativity. Uh, so you can tentatively expect that you could see, and in fact, I think you can barely see this in some of the events, to see you know extra order modes, um, higher order modes uh, to the signal in those um, in those uh, time frequency plots. It will be very difficult to see those in a time series in a time series standard time series. So I think this time time frequency representation really does make sense because of the non-stationarity of the signal, either astrophysical signal or instrumental artifacts that we are dealing with. Thank you. So uh, I think uh, we should thank Eric once again. And for all the questions which weren't answered, you can uh, ask at ask.org link. Uh, thank you, Eric. If you